Um, this is what we're going to do. We've been in a little bit of a series, and um, this thing is so Im impactful for me as I share this with you. And then I'm having some really crazy encounters, and I believe it's because I stepped out, and I want to encourage you to do it. So today I'm going to encourage you to do something. If you're a guest, hey, you're, I'm so glad you're here this morning, and we're excited. And um, we love you. Let me say this. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've been through. Jesus is into you. This is what I know because I know I was a mess. And he proved himself to me, and he will to you too if you give him a chance. If you'll open your heart. Just open your heart. Got to step in and do something. Last week, I, um, Ted, this is Ted for many of you that don't know. Um, we appreciate Ted and his security. Um, last week, Ted, they came to me and told me that uh, the doctors gave you a report. Share us what happened real quick. They gave me a report. Right up, you're good. You're good? Okay. <laughs> Testing, one, two. They gave me a report that I was diagnosed with cancer. So I had a colonoscopy Thursday. Pastor prayed over me. We prayed. And the Lord listened. Took it away from me. Clean slate. So yeah, the Lord's good. Put your faith and trust in the Lord. He won't fail you. Trust me. Well, I don't know. They're telling me as of one week, we pray for him. They, they go do the test and say, well, we can't find anything. We don't know about that. Charlene Morris, where are you at? She's standing back there. I said something last week, but God just touched her. We're in a place of God moving. Now, besides that, our pastor, though, of worship is in a crutch. But that's because he played volleyball with vans on and didn't stretch. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> we do love Pastor Jeremy, but... He called me, and I knew. I just had that feeling. I said, oh, my Lord, this dude got hurt playing. He thought he was six foot six and trying to spike it over the net. We're in a great series. I pray God speaks to you. I want you to know, I started last week, and I said, why I hate religion. And I shared with you the story of the woman at the well who was religious, but it kept her bound. And the story of a, of a crazy man who ended up sleeping in the graveyard because he was so crazy and his life was out of crow. He was cutting himself. But yet Jesus rescued him, and they both found out it wasn't about religion, but it was about a relationship, knowing Jesus and loving Jesus. And so I want to start this little video to start it out. This is a little video that said why I hate religion. Sin. 
I grew up going to church on Christmas and Easter and thinking God's probably proud of me because I stayed awake during this horrible thing through both services. But I found out that Jesus is alive. And that's why I stand here today and share with you. And that's the reason many of you are here. And I want to talk to you today about your stories. You know, your stories are critical He's so into you and wants to build a story with you that you share it with others. Actually, it was the, the woman with the well. Remember that she, she was so bound in religion. Remember she said to Jesus, you do it your way and we do it our way. And he just blew all that away. And he removed her guilt, her shame, her fear, her sin, the condemnation. And it so set her free, she ran to the hills sharing his name. And people came back, and, 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 and she was the messenger. And I was saying to you a few weeks ago, God is calling us to be messengers, sharing our story. But, and I was ready to say, like, some hard things to you, like, go tell your, but I realized it's the devil many times condemning us and holding us back. But you don't have, you don't need to go to Bible college. You don't need to go through all these things. You just need an experience. And if, you, if you've not had an experience with God, you can. And if you have, I encourage you to go share, because that's where you'll see God move. And then I shared the story last week of the man cutting himself. I meant cutting is not a, is not a new thing. And, we, and sometimes, it, like for me, I don't understand that. But what you don't understand, there's pain so deep in people, they're trying to get to a pain they can't reach. And this man was cutting himself. And yet Jesus set him free. The people condemned him. And he was even wanting to leave with Jesus after Jesus set him free, set him in his right mind. And Jesus says, no, you go tell your friends. See, we would have sent him to Bible school. We would have done all sorts of things. But Jesus said, no, you just you go tell them the story. And remember, three chapters later, when he came back, there were over 4,000 people that sat on a hill. As that, and I believe as Jesus was sharing his story, there was a man up there with a, with a tank top on, with scars all over his arms with a smile, saying, I brought the people. I hope you brought the food. He changed lives. You know, this, this what we do, our faith, God now, once God touches you, he wants to use your story to reach those around you. Not the church, not religion, not come a denomination, not cut your hair, not look like this person or that person, but to a relationship. And, and, and the, the crazy thing is, is God chose us to share the story. I wouldn't have done it like that. I wouldn't have chose you, and I sure wouldn't have chose me. Right? Come on, let's just be honest. Just, just be honest. Because we're all mess-ups, but that's part of it. It's your weaknesses 
that, that God uses to share the story. And so, you know, all from the Bible, from the beginning to the end, is about the mission that God came to rescue man, and now that we've got to rescue everybody, because without Jesus, there's no promise of tomorrow. Without Jesus, you are in trouble. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can earn his way. No man can be good enough. I probably say that every week, but you've got to understand the reality of that. No man can earn his way. If you could earn your way to heaven, why would God put Jesus on the cross? It's ruthless. Just so let you earn your way. But we can't. Nobody. Nobody. And so as I'm as I, thinking about, you, you, let me say this to you. This is what the Bible calls us to do who have been touched by God in Jude 23. He just simply says this. And I say 23, there's only one chapter. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. I keep using this verse. But we've got to rescue people around you. And I know many of you thinking, oh, but what if they turn me down? I'm, I'm scared of that. I don't have all the right stories. I don't know about what if they ask me about some theological question? You don't have to have any of those stories. I was going to say, just come and see. Just come and see. You realize I'm a pastor, and sometimes people ask me a question. I say, I don't know. I'm not worried about God's big enough to handle his own stuff. I'm just like, come and see. Look what he did to me. I don't know. I don't understand it all. Are you okay? God wants to use you, and I just want to, I, I'm going to go somewhere this, story, this morning with some personal stories. I'm pretty excited about sharing this so you can hear some things happening in my own personal life. But in Luke 9, verses 1 through 6, Jesus first sends out the 12, and look what he says to them. And he called the 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I don't know if you've seen The Chosen. It's free. But chosen, and I encourage, it's amazing. You'll see the inside stories, and this is a pretty cool story. Damon shared with me this, and then I went back and watched it. And, and the reality of it is, is when he told them, go share the story, they're freaked out. Like, why are we going? Why don't you do it? Like, uh, what if they tell us no? And I mean, Jesus says, don't take any food, don't take any extra clothes. And they're freaking out just like you are, thinking, how am I going to tell my neighbor? How am I going to tell my friend? And he says, go and go heal the sick. Verse 3, he says, and he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money, nor have or two, peni- two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wh- whoever you will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust of your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. What they do? They just did it. And there were testimonies. They actually come back sharing testimonies. Then two chapters later, he says to a group of 70 people, after these things, the Lord pointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he is about to go. And they said to him, he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Here's the problem. People know about religion, but they don't know about Jesus. They know about church, but they don't know about Jesus. They know about flannel graphs in a Sunday school, but they really don't know about Jesus. They know about what they've done wrong, but they don't know the gospel's the good news. You can be set free from that. And they think they have to do it themselves, and so they all count themselves unworthy. Right? I mean, what, can I tell you why I'm standing up here preaching this morning? Not on my own good works. If I counted on my own good works, I'd be sitting down real fast because I flop all over the place. But it's his power, his goodness. Let's read on. Verse 3 says, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And now let's just, we'll skip a few verses. You can go back and read it just for time's sake. Heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. So what do I say? Just go tell people, Hey, he's alive. I just want you to know what he did to me. I want you to know my story. I want you to know he is real. He, he showed me he's real. He's touched me. He's changed me. Well, what if they say no? Some will. But some are looking for for an answer. Verse 9. So let's go to verse, um, we'll just skip a bunch of verses and look at verses 17 through 20 towards the end of the story. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. Here's what they're saying. Dude, it worked. 
Wow! You should have seen what happened. You should have seen that. And they're freaking out because of God really anointed them. What you've got to realize, God has anointed you. The Holy Spirit in you, you have the power to change lives around you. It's not in you. It's in Christ in you, the power to touch and change lives. I'm speaking more right here to the people that are, are locked in this church, but I want you to know, if you're a visitor in here this morning, I'm still speaking to you because I want you to know he's into you, man, and he wants to do a work in you. He loves you. And I know you got a bad track record. Everybody does. Verse, verse 18. i got to hurry. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And I say to you, you know, your name is, if you've accepted Christ, your name written in heaven, that is the greatest thing. And the next greatest thing you could do is help somebody else go with you. Because listen to me, everybody that dies is not going to heaven. You've got to know Jesus. And not religion, you've got to know Jesus. You've got to have this relationship. This place where you really know him, a, a born-again re experience, a relationship with God. I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm not talking about cutting your hair. I'm talking about a relationship with God. And I'll just close with this in Mark 16, 20. There's 100 passages. I, I had to choose like out of 40, and I'm like, I don't even know what ones to use. But at the end of Mark 16 and verse 20, he says this. That he had sent them out, and he said, and they went out everywhere, preached everywhere, and the Lord was working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Over and over, we hear the call to go, to rescue, to change, to, to do a work for the Lord and watch what the Lord does. Now listen, here's the problem with us church people. We think that God just wants just to show up in here and just meet with us in here and do these miracles in here. I, don't, I think that's why we don't see hardly miracle, we don't see enough miracles. Do you notice it was not in the synagogues that they seen the miracles in Jesus' times? It was out in the streets. I'm not saying we don't see miracles in here, but I'll tell you, if you want to see some real miracles, you ought to go out to the streets and watch what happens. That's where you'll see it. That's where some people say, well, why don't we have more prophecy and all this stuff? Look, it, Jesus taught us he loves the 99 but he's chasing the one that's still lost. That's where you'll see the presence of God. That's where you'll see the miracles. That's where you'll see God show up. That's where you'll see things that, things that God do. We should really be filled with Sunday mornings with testimonies like Ted's popping up here and saying things. People that have come from the street, that their lives have been touched and changed. By the way, next week, you're going to hear a little bit about what we do worldwide missions, and you're going to hear some stories that are going to blow you away of changed lives. People in this house of changed lives. You're going to hear some testimonies. So as we walk through this, I want you to realize, we've got to realize, we've got to understand this. God wants to use you. Now I get to start my message. Are you ready? <laughs> what I tell you this morning, I, I can only tell you Pastor Damon knows every word that I say this morning. Of what He's seen the text. He's seen the stories. He's seen what's happening in Excuse me while I open this. It's not by coincidence these all happen right now at this time. Um, don't think that the stories I tell you because I'm the pastor. I'm just like you. I have friends that don't know Jesus that I like, and I don't want to look like a fool in front of them. I don't want them to look at me like he's a religious freak or he's just a pastor or look down at me because I believe in God. I have the same fears you do. I have the same fears you do. None of us want to be hated. Come on, guys. None of us want to be hated. I know he's real because he's changed my life. But on the other hand, when I'm out there, I also want to be sort of cool. As cool as I can be a fat old man, I'm not going to be real cool, but as cool as I can. Come on, right? 
And I go through the same struggles. When I'm out there, I'm just like you. I'm thinking in the back of my mind, how do I share Jesus with this guy? I'd be at a restaurant, and I'm trying to think of ways. And um, when I race, and many of you think I just race to race. I love racing, but don't be fooled why I do it. Because it's been an opportunity for me to share Jesus with lost people that have like, it's been incredible, incredible. And I don't go to the, and if you've ever been at the racetrack with me or ever, I, nobody calls me. I'd punch you if you call me pastor out there. <laughs> I'm not a pastor. I don't, I'm just real out there. But behind the scenes, they see that I really do love Jesus. I don't preach them. And I let them do what they do because lost people do lost things. I don't even know what to tell you, but lost people do lost things, okay? Lost people do lost things. Get over it. Quit freaking out. Quit judging them. You did the same thing before you knew Jesus. I chuckle when somebody will cuss in front of me and then say, sorry. I'm like, dude, stop. Like, I've never heard it before. I didn't ever use that word. It's all right, huh? It's not my job to judge. It's just my job to share the good news in some way that I can. And so I go, I want you, I want you to hear these stories, these miracles. I mean, just this week, two um, But can I tell you the miracles you see because I stepped out on faith. It was 2018. I went back and found the message, Pastor Damon. I made a message on a Sunday morning and I heard it come out my mouth. Sometimes I say dumb things up here. And sometimes, like, something good will roll out, and I'm like, whoa, I, that was good. What did you say? <laughs> like, realizing it's not even me. I'm not even that smart. And I said something on it, and it was 2018. I said, maybe we ought to go pastor our own neighborhoods, and if we pastored our own neighborhoods, maybe we would reach the city. It was in Serve the City sermon series. And I, I never forget when it come out my mouth, and I, and, I, and I thought about it later, like, when I was driving home, like, dude. That was good. <laughs> like, how true is that? And then I thought about what that looks like. And then it was not long until I was with Alan Platt, and he introduced me um, um, to a man named Dave Runyon. Some of you have heard this story, and, um, but I promise I won't be boring with this. Dave was a man who pastored in Colorado and um, some great churches in Colorado um, Colorado Springs and the Denver area, and they decided to come together as pastors. And so they, they raised millions of dollars to build a community center between them, all the churches coming together, right? And which is a cool sign, right? And, and they raised, they built this big community, and they were so proud of themselves. And Dave's like, I was like, well, look at us rock, you know, and all the churches in America ought to hear our story. They invited the mayor and the deputy mayor, and so the mayor came in, and the deputy mayor came in, and they celebrated, and they did this big, this great big celebration over building this building. And all of a sudden, the mayor started saying something from the stage, and it actually crushed every pastor that had raised money to build the building because it turned the lights on. The mayor said, here's what we found out. If you really want to change a community, you've really got to deal with the neighborhoods. Now look, maybe Jesus wasn't so dumb when he said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbors as your... And he said, this is what we found out. If we go, I, we have a police officer right up here. And I, I asked him the story. If there's a tremendous, horrible, tragic thing happen in our community... Are police officers dependent on neighbors taking care of neighbors because there's not enough police to respond to all the 911 calls? And he said, yes. If fires break out in a whole community, there's not enough fire trucks, nor is there enough firemen to take care of the neighborhoods. So the city is the response. It needs neighbors to take care of neighbors. If there's a tornado that rocks through the city, if there's a flood that sweeps away houses, it's neighbors that take care of neighbors. 
Actually, the, the mayor went on to say, we have found out if neighbors will take care of neighbors and respond to each other, crime rate goes down 28% in a neighborhood. This is why the city sponsors these neighborhood watch things, right? And put signs, they pay for it. Because they found out it's true. They found out, I, I, and I, I don't remember the exact number. I think it was actually 30%. Like, the response of the police's action in a neighborhood is like 30% less if the neighbors really do get to know each other. Because if you're watching out for your neighbor's house, nobody's going to rob it without you, right? And, and, and the pastors were thinking, oh, well, we just built this big building. We, this is how we're going to. And they're realizing maybe we missed something. And it was that night that the deputy mayor stood up and said to him, and now it's only Christians in the building. And she said, you know, you realize you heard the mayor say, it's, it's neighbors who take care of neighbors. And she said, the sad thing is, it's not like we have reports that Christians are better neighbors than non-Christians. And he said, you could have let off a nuclear bomb in the house. Do you know you sleep within yards of people that you don't even know their name. You know what kind of car they drive. You know that they have two troublemaker kids. You know that they eat a lot of pizza. You know he has a job, she doesn't, but you really don't know their names, nor do you know a whole lot about them. Some of you are saying, I do. Most of us, we know the car they drive, because here's what we live in in America. We get in our car, we tint our windows, we, let, we hit the garage door and it opens up, we back out, we drive to work and we come back and we're already hitting the garage door and driving in and shutting the door behind us and like, leave me alone, don't come knocking at my door, don't bother me. As a matter of fact, I'm one of those people like, don't knock on my door. Multiple reasons don't bug me. Plus, if you come to the house and the house is messy, my wife will kill me. Right, mama? I love my wife. But my question is, is maybe Jesus knew something that we didn't. Can I get you for a moment just to think about your neighbor in front of you and behind you? What if that's the person that you should be sharing your story with? So after I heard myself say that, I went home, and um, I give a shout-out this morning without crying because I've been grieving a whole lot. I went home to my buddy who passed away, Deacon Brown, and I said, we got a job to do, bub. And I'm not joking. I, I was sitting with him, and I was looking at him, and I said, man, you got to reach the neighborhood because I preached it. Now i got to live what I preach. And I said, the only thing I know to do is you need walking around because you've gotten a little bit fat. I need some walks because I've gotten way fat. And this is the only avenue I know. We're just going to walk the neighborhood until God does something. And I'm just looking. And so I prayed. And I went to battle and prayer every day. God, help me reach the neighborhood. Now, I'm just like you. I don't want to be a nerd. I don't want to be a freak. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? I, I mean, I'm fearing just like you. I'm like, I know I got to reach him, but I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do it without being weird. I don't know. And so it all started one day after we did it that all of a sudden I look out the side of my house and Deacon Brown and I were outside and Kimmy was in. I think she was cooking, doing something. And I realized... Man, my neighbors are burying a dog in the yard. And my first thought is, well, you can't be burying that big old dog in the yard. It's going to. And then all of a sudden the thought hit me. Oh, I love dogs. If I was burying brown, I, the pain would be. So I wonder what pain they're experiencing. I've done a whole lot of funerals. I run in the house. I look at Kim. I'm telling their story. I said, I think I'm going to go do a dog funeral. <laughs> Did I not? 
So I just go to their yard. I think they're probably freaked out because, like, I, I, is it a city violation? Is it legal to, right? But I'm like, something happened to your dog? You know, and with grief. They're both crying and hurting. And so I just, I just said, man, I can't even imagine your pain or what you're going through. Because I love this little boy. His brown was next to me. And like, you know, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, like, would it? I said, I just, I, I want to help. So, you know. If you want me to dig a little bit, I will, or if there's something you need. I said, but one thing I can do is, like, I could, like, pray and, like, just help you. Like, maybe can I just pray with you guys and pray over your dog and your pain and, you know, your kids I know are hurting. They were sitting there. And with tears in their eyes, they're like, yeah, well, okay. And I know they were freaked out. Just like, I'm still a little bit freaked out, too. Like, right? What if they say No. But they said yes. And so I did a dog funeral. I just pulled out, like, I prayed and committed this dog to the ground. I, I've never done a dog funeral before, but I don't, I don't even know if there's such a thing, but I'm doing it. So I pray, and they bury this dog, and I'm from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I'm doing this whole thing. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, I hope you're in this. I hope this is just not insane. And I want you to hear my fears just like yours. I'm, I'm a guy just like you. And we make a long story short. Come to find out there was a girl that was coming to this church at that time that had been praying for her brother. And guess whose dog funeral I'm doing? Her brother's. And then open a door to share the gospel and start some things happening within a family. And it set me on fire. And I'm like, look what God did. I'm petting Brown. I'm shouting to Kim. And I'm so excited. So every day, my excitement is, is Brown, you and I are walking around the neighborhood. And I had the best dog. He didn't need a leash. So, um, and now not all my neighbors love me either. One of my neighbors chased me down because they said I allowed Brown to go poop in their yard, and I didn't pick it up. But understand, Brown only had rabbit pellets, so it was, like, sort of hard to pick. But anyway. <laughs> but I'm walking, I don't, and, and, and I'm praying, God, give me an open door. And I don't remember how many, Kimmy and I don't, you would know the story. I don't, it wasn't the first day this stuff started happening. A few days, I'm walking and just praying, and like, God, Somehow you can get me into every door and meet every neighborhood and meet every neighbor in this, in this block and share your story with every person in this block. And I'm praying and I'm seeking God and I'm trusting him. And one day I'm walking around a block and we get towards the end and I come around and all of a sudden I, I walk around this corner. And, come here, Brown. And I'm walking, getting closer to the house, and I hear this corn music blasting from a garage. And I'm like, Ding, 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 ding. I'm like, uh, Brian Head Welch was just at our church. That's corn. He's listening to corn. I'm like, brown. And I'm like looking in a garage, and he's in there working on his go-kart. And corn music's blasting. And I just stopped, and I said, hey! Because you don't want to just barge right up in their open garage, right? <laughs> hey! He's like, I'm like, you like corn? He's like, yeah. And he comes out the garage. I'm like, Brian Head Welch was just at my church. He's like, are you kidding? He comes all the way to the street. Now he's standing right there on the sidewalk. And so I'm like, ah. stop telling me. And I said, well, I go to this church. It's called the Blended Church. And he goes, are you kidding me? And now I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Here we go. And he goes, I just heard about that church, and I was thinking actually about going. And now I'm on fire. Right? 
And so, I, I te- and so I tell him, oh, man, you could come just like you are. You don't have to dress up. It's a really cool church. You'll love it. And he's like, I, I think I'll show up. And I'm like, oh, great, man. It's great to meet you and all that. And I walk away. Then when I'm walking away, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I never told him I'm the pastor. And it's going to be really awkward <laughs> when he comes. And if I'm on stage, like if Damon was preaching, it'd be all right. If Jeremy, but like it's going to be weird. And so I'm like, Brown, get back here. And I marched back. I said, hey, I, maybe I ought to tell you something. You know, and I just said, well, I'm one of the pastors on staff, is how I said it. And, and so he said, great, man, I went home. And do you remember that night, Kimmy? Huh? You're not giving me a big shake yes. <laughs> I was so excited. I'm on cloud nine. So next day, guess where I'm going again? Around the block, baby. <laughs> Brown and I. And I get around the corner and... Um, um, when I walk around the corner, there he is, and he's waiting on me. But this time it's different. The doors are shut, and there's no music playing. And he said, I was waiting on you, and he said, would you please give me five minutes? He goes, you can bring your dog in. And he says, would you please help me? Just like that. I'm like, of course. So I'm walking in his house, and all the blinds are pulled and everything, and I bring Brown in and tell Brown to sit down. And when I walked in the door, he fell. And he began to cry like I have never heard a grown man cry in a long time. And um, he told me a tragic story of something that he had done. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But he was getting ready to go to prison. As a matter of fact, he's in prison right now. And I don't know if you're watching. I love you and pray for you often. And um, he said, I'm not asking you to help me get out of prison. It's already going to sentence. He hadn't been sentenced yet. He's like, I'm going for 20 years or something. And he's like, I'm not asking you to get me out of it. He goes, and I'm telling you, I did it. I'm ashamed of myself. He goes, I was just, he goes, when you came yesterday, he goes, I was asking God, could you like ever forgive me for what I did? Now listen to me. I I didn't know I was walking into any of this. So don't look like, well, Dana, you're spiritual. No. God was just looking for somebody that would love this, right? Maybe there's somebody in your neighborhood that you and, and make a long story short, man, I, I cried with him. I got on the floor, and I prayed with him. I bought him a Bible, and I built a great, and he came to this church until the day he was locked up. And he's in prison now, but you'll never know the miracles that you'll see or what God will do until you step. See, you came to church and said, I want to see a miracle today. Can I be honest with you? The miracles will happen out in the streets. Because probably Damon doesn't need a miracle today, and Crystal and Augie probably don't need a miracle today, and Lori doesn't, Jeremy may, because he's sitting here with crutches, but. And maybe you just got to go out and get yourself in a mess. You, do, you, do you know how I got saved? You do realize I was the, Kimmy and I were the craziest and, it, and, and I'm going to, I'll share a little bit more about the story, but it was, it was this guy who was like, loved Jesus, and his whole life was sort of messy at the time, but he looked at me, I mean, I had long hair, living with a girl, I'm insane, crazy, wild, nuts, and he looked at me and said, Jesus can heal your girlfriend, because he heard me say Kim was sick. Now listen, behind the scenes, this guy named Mike is saying, I couldn't believe what I said to you. And then I'm saying, oh, God, I put myself in a mess. I hope you show up. But it took one person to be at the right place at the right time that would tell me a story in, in, in a set of circumstances kept until Kimmy and I, it changed our life. And if it wasn't for Mike, that would stand out in the midst when nobody else would say anything and pointed at me. And listen to me. He didn't say, cut your hair, quit sinning, quit smoking dope. Quit drinking, quit doing cocaine on the job. Yeah. 
we all actually made fun of him and dogged him. But it would be the very person that God would use that would have the boldness to look and say, Jesus can heal your girlfriend. And when it came down to it, all of a sudden, I just said, what do you mean, Jesus can heal your girlfriend? And next thing you know, I'm bringing the guy to my house. Unheard of. I mean, I can't even believe that I did it. I did it. And then God did a miracle. What if Mike wouldn't have reached me? What if Mike wouldn't have said anything? I wonder how many people I've let go that I should have said something that God wanted to do a miracle. Or I was worried about saving my own face. So I go racing, many of you know, and um, I love it. I don't know why I like it. It's really a dumb sport. <laughs> my basketball teams are terrible, so I might as well drag race. <laughs> and I remember when I first was going drag racing, I had some Christian people like, man, you shouldn't be hanging out with people like that. And I'm like, then I realized, you know, I think that's what they said about Jesus. And look, like, I've, like, I'm mature enough and I know enough, like, I don't want to go back and be a drunk. I don't want to go back and I'm not chasing women. I got, I got an amazing wife. I, and I just went, but I, I, I went to race. And so I made a decision. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going out there. I'm not going to be the chaplain. I'm not, they have chaplains and they, they pray. They do some good, but they would come and ask, well, we, our chaplain's not here today. We need you to pray. I'm like, no. I'm not here as a pastor. I'm just Daner. I'm just racing. And then I just started hanging out. And I mean, man, the guys, like, all of a sudden, guys just started friending me, and I started being friends. And nobody really knew what I did. Until eventually they started finding out. And then, and I realized some people would sort of shun me. Right? And I remember this one guy who, man, my car was broke, and he's crawling up underneath my car. And helping me fix it and doesn't even really know me. And, and he's just dropping F-bombs. And, and then all of a sudden, he, and, he, and he knew, what, and he's like, hey, I'm sorry. And I'm like, that's okay. I've heard you say it before. I ain't worried. Let's get the car fixed. I don't care. <laughs> anyway, I, I just start sharing stories. And then it was a few years ago that I, had, I was going to this big race, and you sort of had to earn your way in this race. And. I earned my way, and they had this big party, and like, when they go crazy, I'll, I'll leave. And, but I'm going to say, I, they do their thing. They know I, right? And so, it's a bunch of guys, they come, they come on their golf cart, and partying, drinking. And I'm still racing, and they're already drinking, and, and like, come, we want to show you something. And I'm like, uh... Guys, I'm so, get on the golf cart. So now I'm on this golf cart, a bunch of guys drinking and carrying on and riding and drunk driving, yes. <laughs> How could they take me to the park? And you, they say, over there's for you. And I'm like thinking, like, they know I'm not going to drink with them. But look, they've never heard me condemn them. They've never heard me say anything bad about it. Never. I love them just for who they are because I realize lost people do lost things. God forbid that I judge. And he's like, go over there in that cooler. I went over there and opened the cooler. They had bought me like, like a case of these things. And you know what? It, did? it made me cry because I realized, my God. They've, they understand that I'm different, but, but I've loved them enough to know, and they've welcomed me to the party. And so everywhere I go, I, I, I just share a little bit of the story, and I'm really cool with them, and I'm careful what I say. And I just, I just share, and um, four weeks ago, I got to vaguely tell you the stories. I want to be careful. Okay, somebody, if you're watching, man, I'm so excited for what God's going to do in you. And um, a few weeks ago, um, one of, all of a sudden on a Sunday morning, somebody grabbed me as one of my friends that come from the track that was here. 
And I was freaked out about something and trying to get something done, and he's grabbing me from the back. I'm like, whoa, so good to see you, man. And um, he writes this text to me after church. I've never in my life been greeted by so many strangers with hugs and handshakes and warm welcomes. Not one person walked by me without saying good morning, a handshake, or a fist bump. This environment and atmosphere is unreal, man. That was his text after church. So I want to thank you guys for loving him. And I want to show you how important it is when you come, you think about the person sitting next to you because you don't know who it is. And you don't know who invited. He didn't say, I accepted Christ. You preached the greatest message ever. He's like, that atmosphere was unreal. We started this message, Damon, when did we start this series? A few weeks ago. I got three minutes, but I got two powerful stories, and I'm, I'm going to be done here. Mark, Mark, Mark. Come here. Mark. I forgot I was going to title my message, and I screwed up. Will you show us? The, can we just show the video to start the message? Because one of my preaching, I hate religion, but I love my neighbors. Can you just show us the video real fast? Then I'll go back to my story. Thank you, Jeremy. Won't you be my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? So last week, when was it? Came I came in and told you I had a racer friend call me Friday and say, Dana, I'm sorry to bug you, but man, my marriage is a mess. And like she, her and I are really struggling. And he said, you know some of the stories. And he said, but she really liked you, too, when you were out at the track because she said she had never met a preacher who was, like, just, like, really, like, cool. And, and he's like, I know I need help. And she said she'd actually come and talk to you. Would you, like, help us? You know, and I ran in and I said, of course I would. Give me some time to think about it, pray about it, and I want to help. So then the next day I get another text and then he starts giving me some stories of some things he's been through and he's like, you know me, but this is the depth of my story. I need help. And so here in the next few weeks I get to sit with him and you never know. I mean, I didn't expect that phone call from him. And then when was it, Damon? Thursday? Thursday I got a text from another racer friend. And he said, um, I wrote his exact words down. Um, he, said, he said something like this. Would you talk to the man upstairs for me? Because I'm facing a really tough thing. And man, I mean, I, I, I just sat down because I'm like, it was the least call from the least I would have never expected in a million years. And then I get another text and says, I got a heart thing. And, and so I'm, I'm shouting because Damon knows what we've been preaching. And I send him the text and send him a picture and, and tell Kimmy. And I said, pray for me. And then so I just pick the phone and call him. I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? And he's like, he goes, I just couldn't get you off my mind. And he's telling me this tough story that's happening in his life. And. 
You know, as he gets to the store, I'm thinking, okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? How do I do this? 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 And then I just said, you know, I said, I don't, you don't really know my story, but I said, I don't want to sound weird, but you do know that really Jesus changed my life because a man looked at me and said, Jesus could heal my girlfriend. And I said, you know, he just laid hands on her and prayed for her. And I said, could we possibly do this? Could I just like meet you next week? Like, I just want to put my hands on your head and pray for you. And would you let me do that? And he's like, when? When? And I'm like, Monday? He goes, okay, when? And I'm meeting him Monday and praying for him. Now listen to me. What if God does a miracle? What if God doesn't? That's up to him. Hello? And don't look at me because I'm a pastor. No, they just need to know that you're living it. One thing these guys have seen, they've seen me live it in the midst of, but not judge them, not condemn them, not act holier than thou, not act like Mr. Righteous, not acting, just being real. And what I want to say to you as a church, I think that we could affect this city if we just love our neighbors. There was a flyer that was given out to you, or a magnet, and it has a picture of your house. And this is, this is from Dave Runyon. If, um, if, you did, if you didn't get one, if you raise your hand, they'll get you one. Just one for a family. But Magnus, here's what I want you to do. How about this? Why don't you go home and pray and really make a decision? How do I meet the neighbor that lives in front of me? Write down their names. Find out who they are. Find out their story. Not that they drive a minivan. But find out their story. How do you reach them? How do you do something for them? How do we reach out? How do we make a difference in their life? The neighbor behind you and the neighbors on the side of you. And then begin to pray for them. If you'll lift your hand, they'll get you a copy if you want one. Put it on your refrigerator and pray over it. And watch what God does if you decide to do something in your neighborhood. What if you really were the pastor of your neighborhood? What if God set you in that neighborhood to share your story? But you got to get to know him. you got to find a way to reach out. And God will give you the wisdom what to say. Or how about this? What about somebody at work or somebody that you, how about do this? Make a, what I just call a Lord's hit list. We did this years ago. Take a piece of paper and write the people's names down that you're going to start praying for and you're going to believe for an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And you're going to start praying for them every day. Just a quick prayer. Lord, somebody, and, and ask God for the right opportunity at the right time to open the door that you just get to walk right in. A phone call that would say, see, this is what I realize. Many of them won't do a whole lot while they're all together. But when something tragic happens, they're looking for somebody who they see that's living the life. And then the worst thing for us as Christians, my God, sometimes we only have Christian friends. Can I say something? Get out of your bubble. Go coach a basketball team. Go run a Girl Scout group. I don't know, whatever. Start a bowling league. Do a fishing group. Do a hunting group. Something to share. There are three quick prayers. Ephesians, you have to write this down. If, if, if you'll just quickly, if you'll do this. There, there are prayers that Paul prayed, and you could put their names in it and pray. Ephesians chapter 1, starting at around, um, um, starting around 116. Then Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. Then Colossians 1, starting at verse 9. There are prayers like, like, God, I pray that you would grant them the understanding to know the knowledge of your will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding that they may have a walk worthy of you, fully pleasing. Just put their names in those prayers and pray it every day and see what God does in their lives. See what God does in their lives. Think about your prayer with, I'm going to close with this comment. William Booth made this comment. If you don't know who William Booth was, he's the guy that started the Salvation Army, and it wasn't a people that just... just beg for money with little black buckets. In the 1800s, he was the most amazing man who said, we're going to build an army 
that's going to share salvation with people. And somebody asked William, William Booth about, well, are you waiting for a move of God? And William Booth said this, I don't need a move of God. I am a move of God. Some of you need to make a decision. I am a move of God. I'm going to step out. I'm going to step out and do something I've never done before. This is where you'll see miracles. This is where you'll show. This is where you'll see God show up. Get yourself in a mess where God has to show up or you're all in trouble. And watch what God does. And I close with Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and some everlasting contempt. And then look what he said. But those who are wise shall shine like brightness in the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars. For Here's what he said. If you're wise, you'll win souls. It's the greatest thing you could do in the kingdom. It's what we've been called to do. One person said, if you took missions or our mission, our commission to go reach the lost out of the Bible, you would have nothing left but the covers. And Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Father, I give you your people, anoint them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, God, as you've commissioned us, you've said, as you have sent, as the Father sent you, so you send us. Today, Lord, we realize we are commissioned. We are called to go forth and share the story. And this morning, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I pray you give them opportunities. I pray you open doors for them to share your story, God, to share the story of what you've done in their life. God, I pray you do miracles and signs and wonders around them. I pray that lives are touched and changed, and we'll give you the glory, and we will give you the praise, God. Use them, God, as we walk in our Christianity, as we walk in our front, going forth, sharing the good news, God. And if you're in here today and you don't know Jesus, come up here. There's going to be a prayer team, and we'll help you start this journey today. Let us help you start this walk with God. Start it right that you come to God in faith. If you've not done it, come let us pray for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, I love you guys. May God bless you today in Jesus' name.